So welcome back on today's show, Reality versus Perception. We have been discussing how the media influences the way we view things. And joining us to explain how we perceive is senior lecturer from the Department of Psychology at Royal Holloway, Dr. Sonia Durand, who is a lecturer in perception, action, and decision-making. So welcome to our studio, Hi. Sonia. Hi. Glad to have you here. So can you explain to us how our perception actually influences our action and decision making? Right, so um, where I'm coming from is thinking about perception on a very biological level. So mm -hmm. our very first perceptions, how we pick up our senses with our eyes, with our ears, with our sense of touch. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we need to perceive things from a biological point of view is just to be able to interact in the world and survive. Mm -hmm. So really our perception exists mostly, the reason why we're so good at it now when we have this rich perception of the world around us mm -hmm. is to really allow us to interact, find food, escape escape predators. So it, it really at that very basic level, you need your perception to help you make that decision. That thing that I saw moving over there, do I need to run away or should I be approaching no, it? Yeah. So perception yeah. only really makes sense in when you think about what action, what decision is it going to result in. Mm -hmm. So, that's so we could say that we have perception in order to be able to survive. Yeah, that's that's basically why we why we are here because we have a good perception of the world around us. That's at the very simplest level, and then of course how people manipulate that perception is the next level on yeah. that you've been talking about so far. So, so you do enormous amount of research on various things. How do you get your facts from that your research? Yeah, so it's interesting because really when you talk about someone doing research, we don't really tend to deal in facts so much. What we're really looking for is evidence. What's the balance of evidence? So really when I ask a question, I'll ask, does this thing happen more when I do show people this or does it happen more when I show them something else instead? And what I can do is make several observations and then from that I say, well, there's likely that there's a difference between those two things. But I can't say for sure that next time I do that there will be a difference again all I can say is the balance of probabilities is that that will always happen so facts kind of are really when you've observed things so many times then they become like facts so uh, you know if I say I knock that off the table you can be pretty sure that the coffee cup will land on the ground mm -hmm. we'll take that as a fact but actually you can't be sure really 100% sure next time. So we, we tend to talk about at the research phase and a balance of probabilities, but when you teach that at school, obviously you teach it as facts because there are some things that have been shown so many times that you can take them as facts and you need them to then move forward and make assumptions based on that. But, but if you carry on studying it and looking into it into more depth beyond school and university and then where you end up doing my kind of research, you quickly see all those facts are actually not so clear cut and there's a lot more questions that always need to be asked, which is why research is really interesting because the deeper you go, the more questions you often find. <laughs> so now... I'm someone who always like, who, I mean, I would like to think I like to understand facts and be certain of facts. And now you're telling me <laughs> that the facts may not necessarily be facts. So now I'm wondering how much of our reality is actually fact or illusion? <laughs> well, I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, I think all you can do when you want to sort of decide for yourself what a fact is, is go back and look at what the original evidence was mm -hmm. and why they concluded what they did. That's always really important to see if the evidence really, really does hold up what people are claiming. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can call it a fact. So not right? take things on face value. Exactly. Like be someone who exactly. digs into things deeper. But if you, yeah, exactly. But if you think on a sort of more philosophical level yeah. you know, in some ways everything we perceive is just constructed for us by our brains like I was saying to help us in engage with reality so in some sense it's all an illusion mm -hmm. that's, oh yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. Our, that's, that's really our reality is just an illusion basically it is it is something that your brain has created for you to be able to work with the world mm -hmm. so if you think almost like um, your computer desktop yeah mm -hmm. you can't see the wiring the electricity running in your computer mm -hmm. but you can make your computer do things by clicking on things on your desktop. Mm -hmm. So it's a representation that helps you interact with the computer. And that's kind of what our reality is as well, mm -hmm. helping us interact with the world. 
So actually, when you do see an illusion, it usually happens because our brains are really good at interpreting the uh, ideal in vision. So the examples I always use is, is vision, but the light information coming towards you in a 3D world. Mm -hmm. But a lot of illusions are when you show people 2D patterns mm -hmm. and your brain is trying to interpret it in a 3D way. And that's when you get these strange optical illusions. Mm -hmm. So now, um, how, how reliable is our brain? I mean, so we know sometimes that computers can, can go wrong. <laughs> the motherboard, there can be something in the motherboard. But how, is our brain reliable or can there be certain things that our brains are interpreting that are faulty? Right, so I think it's a common mistake that people think because they've seen something, it must have absolutely happened. But actually, your brain is kind of doing the same thing as a scientist is doing, really, trying to interpret what was out there with the best evidence that it's got. And sometimes it gets it wrong if the evidence is hazy and hard to see. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, people very commonly see faces everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's because your brain has evolved to be very good at detecting faces. And actually, it's useful to mistake something for face because that's probably better than missing a face. That could be more dangerous than accidentally mistaking something for mm -hmm. a face. Mm -hmm. So um, we have kind of lots of adaptations that and shortcuts our brain makes mm -hmm. to make us be able to respond quickly. Mm -hmm. And that has helped us survive, but can lead to what you might call misperceptions mm -hmm. if you measured it some other way, not through someone's direct perception. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, you know, mm -hmm. I have an example of how, how that happens in our day-to-day -day life. For example, if we're not, um, we're not normally exposed to people of a certain race, let's say like Asians or, or indigenous Indians, they can end up looking all of them similar. Like we, we can look at them and they look like almost similar in our minds because that's how our brain is faulty. <laughs> in that way well, <laughs> it interprets that information in a faulty way <laughs> again it, it depends it looks like faulty when you give it the task and it gets it wrong mm -hmm. but actually that could be a useful adaptation mm -hmm. because we have limited resources so your brain needs to be good at what it's presented with all the time mm -hmm. so if you've grown up only seeing a certain type of face then you get very good at discriminating those faces mm -hmm. but you pull all your resources into doing that so when you see a set of other different kind of faces that your brain isn't adapted to, mm -hmm. it's not so good at telling them apart. Mm -hmm. But actually, it was a useful adaptation for it to be good at telling your envi ongoing environment apart. So mm -hmm. you can see it's faulty, but also it's actually using the resources Clever. in a mm -hmm. good way. That's Ooh, good. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you've been researching on the neurons and perceptions, but what I'm interested in is that you. I know that a lot of people haven't really studied in uh, sensory um, neuroscience, and I'd like you to explain what that actually is. Okay, so I'm hoping you got a little bit of an impression, mm -hmm. but it's basically neuroscience is just the study of the brain, okay. and sensory is the study of the senses. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the first interface between the brain and the incoming information, and that's what sensory neuroscience is interested wow. in. So my particular um, part of that is vision, visual perception. Mm -hmm. So the information that comes in from your eyes actually goes straight to the back of your brain. Brain. This is the occipital part of the brain, and that's about a third of your brain. Mm -hmm. All it's doing is trying to piece together the light information. Mm -hmm. So simple things like mm -hmm. what colour are things, how far are things away, mm -hmm. what direction are things moving in. So we think of the brain of thinking all these complicated things and emotions, yeah. and but actually a lot of the computation you don't even you're not even aware it's going on, mm -hmm. and it's just trying to piece together, and make sense of all the light that's constantly arriving and changing and change it into something meaningful mm -hmm. that, that we actually Can see. Make sense so, the neuroscience yeah. so neuroscience studies that part of the brain and okay. there are many ways of doing it. So sensory neuroscience is a big a area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So there are people that look at just neurons, so yes. the, very, the very smallest mm -hmm. bits that make the brain, the cells that the brain are made of, and they'll be in a lab and they'll be measuring things directly from the neurons. Mm -hmm. Then there are people that look more in humans like myself, mm -hmm. and they might look at whole brain areas mm -hmm. so they could measure that activity using MRI so you know mm -hmm. the scanners you use yes. when you've yes. got a knee broken you can actually use those to look at brain activity as well mm -hmm. or they might use electrodes which sounds very uh, like invasive <laughs> but they're just things that measure electrical changes on the scalp mm -hmm. or sometimes I just ask people so I will show people visual um, stimuli different things to look at and ask mm -hmm. them did you see that moving left or right like mm -hmm. very basic things like that mm -hmm. and from that I try and infer 
what the brain is doing. Mm -hmm. so, so can this help to kind of completely change someone's perception? Um, whether sensory fact. neuroscience can help change people's perception. I mean, again, there's many different levels to it. I mm. mean, um, I'm sort of at the basic level, just trying to understand the little building blocks okay. of how it pieces together. Eventually, of course, you hope it translates into actually helping people yeah. who have mm -hmm. visual deficits. We're, we're but, yeah, yeah, but we're that, able to help that in some eventually, sense. I mean, the hope is that understanding more about how it works in people who where it is working will help you then find therapies for the others. And there's certainly been developments from visual neuroscience where they've been able to start um, giving people sight back mm -hmm. by reproducing some of these early actions mm -hmm. that the brain is doing. Mm -hmm. So the very first neurons, if they're damaged, we actually understand. Mm -hmm. Not about what the they're way. doing, so we can rebuild it a little bit. Interesting. Very. So you mentioned that some of the things our brain picks it up without us actually being aware of. But is there something that we can do to be more intuitive, like to, to pick up more things that our brains are picking up, in a sense, to pick up more details, to be able to interpret what we see in a deeper level? Is there things that we can develop as human beings in order to, be, to develop our intuition, in a sense? I don't know if my question makes sense. <clears throat> um, I guess I could answer that in a sense. So actually, um, w w the other thing that limits our perception is what we pay attention to at mm -hmm. any given time. So we kind of think that sitting here, we're taking in everything from the room around us. It's all arriving to us at the same time. But that's just not true. We mm -hmm. can't process that all at once. Mm -hmm. So our brain, what it does is it focuses in at different parts of the scene, different times. Mm -hmm. So whether you can train your attention to yeah. kind of have a, a wider sphere and pick up more things, that's still an open question. And people are, are trying to see the limits of that. There seem to be some pretty basic limits on how many things we can pay attention mm -hmm. to at the same mm -hmm. time. And of course, that's very relevant if you are thinking about pre presenting pilots with lots of information, etc. There's, there's limits on how much information people can actually process. I think mm -hmm. probably people are individuals. So I, I suppose I suppose people have different levels. I'm mm -hmm. sure some some would be able to really stretch their yeah. their perception and you know and reality of this room, for example. And some may may be very limited. So I suppose we're all different in that sense. Again, and it depends what you think is relevant yeah. to you yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I guess one of the things you can do is not be distracted easily by someone going like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's not a question for you. I've always wondered how different are people's perceptions on shapes and colours? Well, that's an interesting question because you'd think that something as basic as colour and shape, maybe we all do see in a similar way. But it seems that um, what we were talking earlier, how your lifetime's experiences can influence how you interpret things also, um, um, your language actually has a strong influence on how you perceive colour, for example. So there's some evidence suggesting that um, certain tribes that name their colours in different ways and have fewer colour names actually see colours differently. So they are not so good at telling apart colours that they have the same name for, mm -hmm. whereas where we would differentiate and have two different names, we are better at telling those colours apart. Mm -hmm. So our language is influencing even our basic perceptions. But when it comes to actually uh, measuring how people see colour, we do have ways of measuring differences between people and, and how we perceive shapes. And we have some idea as to which brain areas do that. And there's also lots of things that are very similar between people as well. So we all have similar areas for processing shape and colour. And we have ways of pre presenting people and asking them which colours they're seeing. But as to whether we can get at whether we all see the same colour when we see the colour red, that's a bigger philosophical question that's really at the heart of neuroscience. So we can both look at the same colour, we can both say it's red, I can even measure our brain activities and they can look similar, but can I really ever say what you're experiencing is the same that I'm experiencing? That is... Um, really uh, one of the big questions out there. So. It's really quite interesting, isn't mm. it? Mm. Indeed. Thank you. So we don't have time for any more questions. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the section, but it's been such a pleasure having you. Thank you very much for having me. It's you have enlightened us, show. and it felt like we were in a lecturing room. So. <laughs> I hope not too much. <laughs> <laughs> because I love that kind of environment. I love being in a learning environment. So I actually enjoy this all, part of the show. We all never stop learning. Once yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Neither do I, for learn. sure. Yeah, exactly. So thank you for taking your time thank to visit you. us. Um, we're going to go for a short break. And after the break, we'll be back with more on reality versus perception. Mm -hmm.